right, so let's give it up for Jay. Jay has been doing an awesome job. He has sinus issues. He's getting adjusted to the weather and all that kind of good stuff. Jay, you've been doing an awesome job. Well, I'm excited because this topic of uh, M&A and diverse suppliers is so near and dear to my heart. There's no shortage of work, and there's certainly no shortage of ready now, capable, diverse businesses ready to answer the call for, for any reason. So we're going to have two amazing uh, guests join me here on stage. So come on down. Down. So Taurus, please come on down to the stage and Jose, please come on and I'll give you an opportunity as we get situated to introduce yourself to the audience. But um, we are so happy to have them. So let's give them a big hand as well. So Taurus, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, but I have a fun fact about you that I wanna know more about, but I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself first. Thank you very much, Victoria. <laughs> yes. uh, mic check, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the welcome. Jay Ajamu for having me from Comcast. Um, Brian from M MSDC. I'm here with a number of people from our companies, including Valerie Cofield, who's our EVP at Carr and Duff, uh, Janine Gardner, um, a couple of the, you know, sort of recruiters from our e, &E technical division. And if you could just raise your hands, please, it would be great. Jerome. Um, Salim and Rhea, who all just joined in the last couple of months. And then awesome. my former colleague, Keith Garvey, is here from Lafada Construction or con Contract Services. My name's Taurus Richardson. I'm originally from Bethesda, or in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, with a firm. You might as well say DC. Or DC. <laughs> yeah. uh, firm called IMB Partners. IMB stands for Investors in Minority Business. Uh, we were set up to basically buy and build businesses either through partnership or acquisitions. Uh, to date, we've made seven acquisitions and one large strategic partnership. And by the end of October, we'll be at a billion dollars. So I look forward to talking with you guys. Congrats, by the way. <laughs> so good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. A pleasure to be here. My name is Jose Moss. I'm CEO of a company called Mostec. With me today is Rick Suarez, who runs our communications business. Uh, Mostec, we are a construction company that focuses on infrastructure. So we do everything from communications infrastructure, which is really where we got founded, and I hope to talk about that later. Uh, but, you know, we, if you think about all of the different telcos that exist, the cable TV operators, even some of the electric companies, kind of dig ditches. That's how we started, digging ditches, putting in stuff in the ground, uh, building the communications networks. Uh, later in, in our history, and we'll get into that later too, we, we really diversified and expanded our base. So today, We've got a very large presence in the energy markets where we do everything from distribution, transmission to generation. We've got a large pipeline business where we do a lot of work in the oil and gas markets. Uh, we've got um, a, a, a very large presence across the country, over 35,000 people. Today we're a Fortune 500 business. We expect to do about $13 billion of revenue. Next year, a lot of that has been both organic and acquisitive growth. So I look forward to sharing our story with you and telling, uh, to you, ex explaining how we got there anyway. That is awesome. So give them both a hand and you can see that we only brought you the best, right? This is a master class. So get your notes. I've been taking notes, Professor. Just incredible job. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams and, and, and everyone uh, who's spoken today so far. So fast fact, fun fact, Taurus. Reggae and Zumba. Talk to us about that. It's one of your passions. I got to know more about it. So talk to us about that. Um, let's see. So I grew up in Chicago. My dad actually bought a bar when I was eight years old and we lived on top of it. So I grew up listening to music from, you know, 8 p.m. to 2 in the morning I love and it. studying <laughs> afterwards. And I fell in love with music and around 80 you know, house music was coming out in Chicago. I fell in love with it. And so I traveled the world for house music and a part of that love of music and dance. It's Zumba, is, Zumba it. is a night or a daytime activity. So I get to go to gym classes wherever I travel and hit Zumba classes. And I love, love that it. as well. Are you going to teach one? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're so busy, right? You may not have time, but I think, you know, like when we're doing our networking event, you might want to bust the move and give us something. I'm actually not a good dancer. I love music. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. So, can I add a fun fact Yeah, to yeah, that? yeah. Do it, so do Zumba, it. So Zumba, the founder of Zumba is Beto, Beto, who's from Brazil, and he lives like three blocks from me. 
Oh, how come? Okay, uh, now see, Jose, I don't, do Zumba, though. I don't do it. Jose, you start some. I feel like you have to give us a private I, lesson I'm now. Not, I'm not doing it. I'm just saying. I just know. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have a fun fact about Jose. How many of you saw him on the CBS hit show, Undercover Boss? Did anybody see that episode? So, Jose, talk to us. What was that like? It was amazing. It was a long time ago. It was 10 years ago. <laughs> I was season finale of season three. And for those of you that have watched the show, whether it was mine or not, it really is an incredible series. They, they come in and they explain to you why you should do it, which at first I'm sure everybody says no because you have zero editing rights. Imagine that. They come into your business. They say they're going to follow you, take video of you, and no matter what happens, you can't block it. What anybody says can't be blocked. So we did 400 hours of video for a 40-minute show. It's basically two weeks. They come in, they pick you up. They don't tell you where you're going. So every day you're traveling to a new city, you have no idea what jobs lined up for you, who you're working with. They work with people within the company. They don't share any information. It's, it's remarkable. And then a lot of people ask, well, how don't people know? Obviously, everybody knows you're on a TV show. There's cameras everywhere, so it's got to be a farce. So they actually invent a different name of a show for the production. So in my case, everybody knew they were on a TV show. Uh, they thought they were on a TV show called Second Chances. And it, I was a basketball coach in Colorado that had been fired from my basketball gig looking <laughs> for a new career. And I was working in these different construction areas. And the premise of the show was at the end of the show, each person that I worked with would have to decide whether they would hire me or not for that function. Uh oh. <laughs> so, but in that, behind all that was Undercover Boss. And it was, it was incredible. My, my biggest fears going into it were really people complaining about the business or their pay, more importantly, or our customers, right, disparaging one of our customers. And what I found in the process was totally different. What I found was the only thing people cared about, the only thing they wanted to talk about, was how did their everyday function impact the health of the business? How did they make a difference at the company? We were a big company. You know, these are people working on the front lines, and they wanted to know how their job every single day impacted the success of the business. And what I realized is we were doing a really bad job of letting people understand their worth and what they meant to the company. So it was really eye-opening for me. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, it was a lot of fun on top of that, and it's, it's still something that I get to talk about 10 years later. I love it. A decade later. So not only do we have M&A experts up here, we got an undercover boss superstar. And a Zumba expert. I know, right? I'm telling you, just stay tuned for the networking event. You never know what's going to happen. Well, gentlemen, thank you again for being here today. Again, such an important topic. We have an audience that wants to hear all the tips and tricks and secrets so we can help grow businesses because this is about growth and development. This is about our communities. This is about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so when you think about M&As, I'll just ask one of the first questions that I know, I know it's on my mind. What are some of the barriers? What are some of the barriers? Let's just get the elephant, you know, that's in the room right on the table. What are you saying, Taurus? We'll start with you. Um, I think barriers are is mindset um, mm -hmm. of the audience. How many people who are thinking about buying a business versus growing a business organically by showing of hands. And so if you look at the room, so many people think of it as this very difficult thing to do and don't figure out how to make it a part of their business strategy. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is to demystify the, the challenge of growth through acquisitions versus organically trying to win contracts with large corporations. So mindset, for sure. Got it. Thank you. If you, if you own a business and you're trying to buy a business, the first question is, where do I get the money, right? Do I have the money? Do I actually have the ability of making that investment to expand my business via acquisition? And, and I think it's, it's, two, it's two sides, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a buying side, but there's also a selling side. There's a lot of people that ultimately want to get to that point where they can sell their business, and there's lots of challenges with selling your business to, as well. But I, I think on the buy side, that initial transaction, the hardest part is actually understanding how you can craft it with whatever means you have available. Money being the biggest obstacle, right? And, and you know, as we get into this, I think you, you really have to understand the concept as to why you're trying to do the deal in the first place. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think the biggest challenge for us all is how are we gonna pay for it? So we gotta think about mindset, right? Do we have a growth mindset, number one? Uh, how do we overcome those challenges? And then one of the biggest ones I'm hearing you say, Jose, is how do we pay for it? 
So here are a couple of fast facts about um, minority businesses. And I thought they were pretty fascinating. I'm like Jay, I'm a student, I'm a lifelong student. I'm back in school now at Cornell again. <laughs> I, can't, I just can't get enough. And so I'm always you know, researching, I wanna learn more. And when Jay and uh, you know, the team put this event together, I wanted to learn some of the fast facts about this space. And I thought it was interesting that minority businesses own more than 8 million firms in this country and drive 1.4 trillion in annual revenues. And that's probably outdated because that's last year's stats, right? A lot has happened in 2022. MBs, you know, minority businesses create job opportunities, tremendous growth. So there's tremendous value there. And over the past 10 years have created almost 5 million jobs in this country. And 50% of all businesses in the last two years have been minority owned businesses. So the need is there, the opportunity is there, and that's why this masterclass is so important because we gotta understand how to do it and how to do it effectively and how to do it in a way that's sustainably. So um, let's just keep jumping right into it. So we talked about some of the barriers, you heard that, mindset and resources. Let's talk about some of the disparities that we're seeing between even the diverse groups. When I did my research, I noticed that our Asian businesses have more businesses, more revenue, then it's the Hispanic groups, and then it's the Black-owned businesses. Why do you think there's such disparity between those groups, and how do we close the, those gaps? Because there's enough room for all of us, you know, regardless of what you know, dis, uh, you know, minority group you're in, and how do we help everyone win in this space? Yeah, so if, I think the first stats that you laid out, I think they actually make a ton of sense, right? Minorities have less opportunities at big corporations. Mm -hmm. We just do, whether we like it, whether we don't like it, whether the world is changing or not. Historically, we've had less opportunities. So for people in these communities to make it, they've got to build it themselves. And if you're fortunate enough to try, I think that's why we have so many small businesses that are started by minority firms. Mm -hmm. the, the fastest growing sector of small businesses are minority owned small businesses by far the fastest growing, growing sector within small businesses. So I think depending on where you came from and depending on what minority group you are and what opportunities you had in front of you gives you an opportunity to start those businesses faster or not. So in, 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 in my case, in our business, you know, Mostic was founded by, the predecessor company Mostic was founded by my father. He immigrated to this country at the age of 20, nothing but the shirt on his back. He came here, joined the U.S. Army to participate in the Bay of Pigs invasion. That was his whole reason of coming to the United States got on a boat, they were starting on the way to Cuba, Bay of Pigs invasion failed, the boat turned around, dropped everybody off in Miami, and he didn't, he didn't have a penny to his name, didn't speak the language, but couldn't go back. So he had to reinvent his life. And worked a bunch of odd-end jobs, got very lucky, got an opportunity to, to turn around a business, which he did, and then they gave him half the business. I mean, that, that, that for him was, it was his roots, right? And his dream was, you know, how do I build something better for my family and my future? And I think that when you look at the immigrant groups that have come over a long period of time, for a lot of them, it's that, right? It's, it's you have no, there is no option, right? It's either you, you succeed or you fail, and failure is not an option, so I'm gonna do everything I can to possibly succeed. And I think it's a mindset. I think when, when people think that way, and you're all in, and you're going for it, and you can't fail, I think that's what leads to the growth and the ultimate success of so many minority businesses because it's a different mindset than I think the, the greater population has. And Jose, we heard Taurus talk about mindset as one of the barriers. You said a word that just you know got me jumped up in my seat and that's reinvention. So when do small businesses know when to reinvent? I, I think all businesses have to figure out when to reinvent. Mm -hmm. It's not just small businesses. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can tell you in my case, I grew up in the business. So as a kid, you know, when we were in high school, first job my dad would force us to do was dig ditches with a pick and a shovel. Hated it, but I learned an enormous amount of valuable lessons doing it. Uh, I had the ability to go get a good education, go to college, got a master's, and I got the chance to become CEO of Mostic in 2007. And in 2007, we're a $900 million business. Uh, not bad, it's a great business. We were a $100 million business four or five years before that. But the bulk of our business was around laying fiber for uh, 
uh, across the country based on the Telecom Act of 98. It was really the invention of the Internet and all the fiber that got la laid out for the early Internet adoption. And in 2001, the bubble crashes, and our business goes from, you know, a billion dollars to a couple hundred million dollars, right? So that was one area of the company having to reinvent himself. Mm -hmm. I, get, I become CEO in 2007, and we're predominantly a telephony-based company. We're working for the telcos, and the biggest piece of our business was putting in second cables for fax machines and for second phones. I mean, think about that, right? Fax machines. Right. I've seen a fax machine in how long? And we had to reinvent ourselves, and we had to figure out other businesses to get into if we wanted to grow and sustain ourselves. So 95% of our revenues were telephony-based. Fast forward to today, I mean, we're an incredibly diversified business in power, in oil and gas, in power generation, in wireless, right? So you have to make a decision where do you see the business going? Where are you in the evolution of your business? And is it time to pivot? I would argue, right, that smaller businesses have a bigger advantage than I do as a bigger business. Sure. Because you can pivot faster. I'm steering a big ship, and I, every time we turn it, it takes time. And I gotta, I gotta re-steer that ship all the time. I think it's actually easier for smaller businesses, but you gotta know when. Can I say one more story Absolutely. here real quick? 2000, the pandemic hits. We talked about the pandemic earlier. 63% of our earnings at Mostec, we were a $6 billion company at the time. 63% of our earnings came from building oil and gas pipelines. Pandemic hit. Oil prices go negative. Not zero, negative. Doesn't make sense, right? They went negative. We sat there looking at ourselves saying, my God, there's never going to be the need for another pipeline ever in this country again at that moment in time. It's 63% of our earnings. What are we going to do? You know what we better do? We better reinvent ourselves. Mm. So if you look at our M&A activity from 2000 to today, it's been the, the busiest period of M&A activity in the history of Boston because we realized we needed to pivot. We did $5 billion in 2020. 50% of our revenues that year were almost oil and gas. Next year, we're going to do $13 billion. Less than $2 billion of that's going to be oil and gas. So we pivoted. We completely reinvented ourselves in two or three years. It wasn't easy. It's hard. There's lots of, and, you know, we can talk about it. But at every moment in time, wherever you are, wherever your business are, you have to reinvent yourselves. You've got to be thinking about what's the next two, three, four, five years going to look like, and how do I best position myself to be able to take advantage of what's happening in the market? That, that's a lesson all in of itself, right? Knowing when to pivot and how to reinvent. Tars, what would you add to how do we close the gap in the disparity between? Um, so I think the first step, Ben, is collective engagement, right? So when you, again, if you think about it, how many of people in here have invested in their friend's business or a family member's business? And for some reason, not enough of us write checks to each other. Yes. And so, Say that one, one more time. <laughs> for some reason, not enough of us write checks to each yes. other. Yes. And so if we take the Asian community, when I look at how they're funded, they're funded from within their, their social group at a much higher rate on a handshake, on a one sheet of paper basis, because they know the family or they yes. know the community of which they're getting the money from. And if you just sort of trickle it down, Hispanics have, again, a lot more past the hat money, if you ask me, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because they're coming from outside of the country into the country oftentimes. And so they got a different way of starting that first check. In the black community, for some reason, it is not a big culture of it, mm -hmm. in my own experience. So my own sort of story is that in 2010, I lost my job. And I sort of had to pivot try to figure out who and what I wanted to be. I no longer was this fancy private equity person. I decided to be an entrepreneur to start a business to try to buy businesses. I had been in a traditional generalist buying companies at, you know, that I thought were good businesses, but once I had no money and I didn't have a strategy anymore, I decided to go talk to people. And Ajamu in particular and Jay were some of the people I talked to. I talked to people at Merck and EY. And I was like, how is it that there could be companies like Mostec and so many other, you know, sort of minority businesses out here in the MBE world, but this fancy capital called private equity doesn't invest in them? What are the barriers? What are the challenges for the corporates? And how do I take my position? And ultimately, I landed on utilities, which I had never played in, and in government contracting, because I thought they were regulated markets where diversity mattered. 
I thought that if you were to buy and build something as opposed to acquire it or as opposed to starting it, it would help the corporation because the corporation is in this phase of reducing the supply chain and they can't be taking small businesses. And so if you can't buy into the customer at a scale that matters, then it isn't gonna be an advantageous position for you to work with that company. But if you can buy big enough business, it can help them and it can help you. And so my pivot was number one, trying to figure out what industries to play. To me, the biggest opportunity, no matter where you're coming from, is not the money first, but it's the deal. Mm -hmm. When you meet founders and owners of businesses, it's their baby. Mm -hmm. And they want to transition that to someone that's gonna care for it as if it were their own. And if you make the case that you're a good partner and that you treat people fairly, they will give you an unusual deal if you need it. My first acquisition was in 2014, a business called e and &E out of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And that gentleman and his wife gave me a seller loan to close that transaction. I had no cash free, it was all in paper, and the guy trusted me on a handshake, gave me the money to buy his business. I soon paid him back 12 months later and it all worked out. But it's the trust factor mm. of the deal that you set with the owner of the business that is probably more valuable than the money because once you have the deal, you can go find the money. Um, so the pivot is clarifying who you wanna be. Don't worry about the money. Trust that the universe will conspire to help you. And then make sure you buy things that are valued by the customers that you're gonna ultimately be doing business with. I love that. And, and I think it speaks to sometimes we think of M&A as taboo because to your point, it's my baby. Like, do I really want to consider selling something that, you know, has my blood, sweat and tears? So can you tell us a little bit more about the benefit of it? Because I'm finding that M&A's is a path to growth and it gives us the opportunity to be even more competitive. So Taurus, can you tell us just a little bit more about how to think about that a little differently. Yeah, so, so I start with um, my daddy bought a bar in 1978. I was eight years old. He made me one of four shareholders, my brother, mom, and he. We needed $120,000, and the bank gave us you know, 20% or 80% or 80%, 84,000, and we need to go find 40 uh, with fees. We went door to door, we went to our doctor, our dentist, uh, literally our neighbors, and we were short $4,000 at the end. We went to the bank with me and my mother, dad, and me, my brother, and then my grandparents. And the bank said, look, if all y'all showing up, I'll give you the X $4,000, and we bought that business. Oh. And today it's still in business 43 years later. We got a street named after us. We've hired over a thousand people. We put a number of people through college or JC. And even though it's just a bar that's got, you know, 300, 400 person capacity, it is a real place for people to entertain and to create jobs and to learn how to work. That's been tremendous for my family mm -hmm. and for its community. It is through an acquisition. And so in, at 17, Reginald Lewis bought a couple businesses out of Baltimore and New York. He created a, the first black guy to be on Fortune or Forbes 400. He had made $400 million through two acquisitions. I looked at my mom at 17 and said, that looks like a good job. <laughs> and, and so I've spent my entire life from working in mergers and acquisitions in my first job at Solomon Brothers to starting a bank in Ghana to every business I've done after has been in private equity because you can create abnormal wealth. I went from no money to, you know, we'll have a billion dollar business in eight years of acquisitions or 12 years since I started this business. It's every reason to believe you can make a hundred to a billion dollars of personal wealth by doing this. And in the process, I can give tremendously to community groups and to invest in other people. I probably have 30 private investments in individual businesses that I'm just backing people, trying to pay it forward. 60, 70 people invested in my business, including, you know, a secretary put $20,000 up and just made $540,000 a couple months ago. It's a cycle where if we help each other own businesses, help each other grow businesses, 
it creates a very valuable community. I love it. I love it. I think we should give him a hand on that one. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard a lot about integration and culture, and that's really important. So now let's fast forward to maybe an M&A has happened. You know, it's about how do we set both parties up for success, the company that purchased, the company that's being acquired. I know in my, you know, tenure over years in, in corporate America, I've been a part of mergers and acquisitions, and it never feels good. It never feels good when uh, it feels like a hostile takeover, right? So talk to us about the importance of culture and integration. And we heard a lot of comments today. You know, I think you even have uh, one of your teammates here who, you know, one of his key functions is all about communication and culture. And and so um, talk to us about the importance of the integration process. What does that look like? And I, I think it starts long before the deal ever closes in your and your selection of the target, right? So selecting the company that you're ultimately gonna buy, culture, if the culture doesn't work, the deal's not gonna work, period. Most, most deals fail, so if the culture doesn't work, it's not gonna work. And it's truly understanding why you think that culture is gonna work. So down to, you know, how does that management team deal with its employees? How does the owner, if he's staying, what are the things that, that are important to him relative to how he deals with his employees every day? What are the incentives in place? What are the things that make that organization tick? And do you plan to change any of them or not? And understanding that long before you ever make the decision in buying, and what are you bringing to the table? How do you ultimately make that business better? And there's, there's two types of acquisition, right? One is you're more financial in nature. You're buying a business that's going to survive that you're going to invest in and allow the people that are running it to kind of grow it and manage it and you're somewhat of a passive investor or you're an operating business that's actually buying a business that you fully intend to fully integrate into your business because you see the benefits of putting them together. But, but I truly think it, it starts all the way at the beginning. And then it's about you know, saying the things that, that the plan that you had, it's actually playing it out the same way without making drastic changes along the way. Think about two, you know, couple gets divorced, Parents remarry, and they each have three kids or two kids or whatever it is. You know, those kids didn't decide for those parents to remarry. But those parents are now remarried. They made the decisions. But it's those kids that have to live with that decision. And it's, it's that interplay that's going to ultimately make a family or not make a family. Mm -hmm. And acquisition is exactly the same, mm -hmm. right? The, the owners of the business may have decided to merge, but they didn't really get a lot of input from most people most of the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. they do. So now it's getting these two teams to understand that you know they've got to make a family out of it and not that one team's better than the other because that i think that's one of the biggest issues you buy a company and your team automatically thinks well we must be a lot better than them that's why we're buying them no quite frankly right if if you were that much better we wouldn't have had to buy the company to start with because you probably would have done exactly what that company did to, to put itself in a position to get sold so it's it's really getting both sides to understand that they each bring something to the table and managing it to that without one being particularly superior or better than the other at all levels. Yeah, I love that because when you think about it, right, if I'm acquiring a company, the whole goal is to help us win faster, right, to be more profitable and, and we know what comes with that. Taurus, anything to add to the importance of culture and integration? I, I think you gotta start with your values, right? So for us, we say diversity is an asset yes. and we're looking to be in an ecosystem of people that believe that. We believe partnership and people first. And what that means is simply, we wanna make sure that everyone wins a little bit more than we win because life is short. And if you don't like us, please don't sell your business to us, right? Yes. Because we're in it for the long term with you. Uh, we believe diversity and inclusion requires intentionality. If you're not comfortable or don't believe in that, then don't partner with us because we're going to put DEI and supplier diversity and community development into our, you know, sort of business plan on an intentional way. And then finally, we got to be entrepreneurs. We're buying, you know, businesses with three to 12 million of EBITDA, 10 to 100 million of revenue. They're relatively small businesses where that founder or that management team knows every employee, every supplier, every customer. Our job is to make sure nobody leaves. Mm -hmm. When people leave, we lose money. Right. And so step one is to get them comfortable that we are here to be your partner, that we want to keep things the way they are, but sort of add a little bit additional resource, a little bit more capital, a little bit more people 
to help you accelerate growth in ways that most smaller businesses don't invest in. If we can get them to trust us with that fundamental bet and mm-hmm. our values, then we win. And if yeah. we don't, it's, 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 a, it's an uphill battle to try to fix it. Yeah, it goes back uh, to your your comment about mindset, right? Because at the end of the day, if I have the mindset that you that we're going to be in a partnership so that we both get better, right? We're not here to fix anything necessarily, right? We're just here to enhance. We're we're here to help, you know, both parties win faster and go further. And I love that. Can, can I add something? Yeah, so please. I think it also depends on where you are in your evolution as a business. So as we've gotten bigger, it's gotten harder for us quite frankly. When we first started buying companies, we would buy a company in a space that we probably weren't in, right? So if we were buying, like for, I'll give you an example, we bought our first wireless asset that their whole world was building wireless networks. Well, we were kind of doing wireline, we weren't doing wireless. So it's a lot easier because you, you try to find the ways in which you can help the business, but the integration is somewhat simple because you're kind of coming into a bigger company, but there's not a lot of other people with your job within that company. So for years, our philosophy around M&A was, you know, we're looking for that company that is underfunded, that, you know, they have great, the customers love them, they have great opportunities to grow their business, but for whatever reason, they don't have the capital to support it. It might be that they're not willing to sign a personal guarantee on a loan. It may be that, you know, the spouse doesn't want the other spouse to sign up their personal guarantee or their house, right, to put it, to put it all, to, to roll it all again. Maybe they rolled it once or twice, they're not ready to roll it again, but they see this huge opportunity. And in those cases, we would buy companies, we would give them a significant part of the back end of those deals. So if they actually achieved the growth, they would make a lot more money than by selling their company up front. That was really effective for us as we grew. But then we got a lot of scale. So now the, the acquisitions changed, right? It was about, we've got a customer, they've got a lot of work, we've got to significantly grow to meet the demands, and you know we could do some of that organically, but if the customer wants it done faster, then some of that we have to go out and do acquisitively. Those deals are different because you're bringing people into an organization that already exists, and now you're trying to find a way to make you know both organizations together. I agree 100%. If we lose people in a deal, we failed. Mm. There's so many companies that buy deals based on synergies, and they come in and there's some you know they do some math formula that says I can cut 30% of the costs out of the business, and that means I can get rid of 30% of the people. With every person that walks out that door, there's a history, there's relationships, and there's dollars that are going with it. It's a terrible way to try to buy a company, to think that you're going to make it up on synergies. So the idea is how do you get two entities together and how are they better together than they were individually apart? I think that's very powerful. Yeah. Um, Yeah, we were doing fun facts. So I'm a big guy that believes in mentors, both indirect and direct. Um, and in my list of five indirect mentors is Jose Moss. Um, I just want to be very clear what you have built and what you've done is exceptional. And you've come from a family business to where you are today. It is an absolute case study on how to go from small to big. And so I don't want the compliments. I want to take one small break. Please compliment Jose yes, on everything you yes, said. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I love that. And, 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 and just the reason why I, I take a break is because he's now at a different stage of the food chain, right? Mm-hmm. Which is he's talking as a strategic buyer at scale where everything he's buying is actually adding on and there's a different integration curve. And I think for many of you, many of you may be coming more from a short chip stack and a small business play where your point was when you're smaller, you can move more nimbly and be able to pivot and basically not have to change anything and to love the owner and to keep them there mm-hmm. and to give them the second bite in the apple. That is just a different game than what you're playing when you get to $13 billion. They both work. It's just you have five more levers to play when that owner has built this business and isn't ready to have it become named Moztech or named Comcast or feel like they had a report to some random vice president. In the case of you, you can say you can leave your name, you can stay the chair, you could do this and that. And you have these degrees of labeling someone to give away their business to someone they don't know, but in a safer way to transition a succession out of the business. And it's just two different games, but ultimately we all, well, I aspire to be more like him. Um, But at the moment, I get to play a smaller footprint that gives me more levers to work with founders. I love that. And as I listen to you, 
I actually want to be more like that. <laughs> see, see how this works? As, as, as crazy as I it sounds. I love it. Right? So I think we I are a little it. bit different, right, in that we still view ourselves as a family-owned business. So even though we're, you know, the size that we're at, we still take immense pride in how we came up, what it took to get here, and it's part of our DNA and our culture. And every employee that works at Mostec, wherever they're from, 35,000 of them, they know our story. And they know how hard it was for us to be where we are today and what it took for you know, my parents and their generation to give me the opportunity to be sitting here today and all the hard work and all the effort and all the bruises that it took. That's an important part of our culture and our DNA at our company. It's what, it's what drives us. It's what makes us successful. So whoever comes onto our team, or whatever the size of the acquisition, that, that philosophy, that culture, even at a big scale, that, it's still critically important because if they don't buy in, if they can't buy in that that's the way that we're gonna manage, that's not gonna work for us, no matter what size it is, no matter how much we think we might be able to gobble somebody up, it doesn't work because people leave. So that okay. culture becomes that much more important to make sure that they truly understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish and that they buy in. I love that. I have another question, but I wanna do a time check, Jay. How much time do we have before we engage the audience and see? Okay, so we're good. All right, so I want to know this, like it's top of mind for me. Tell me about a time or tell us about a time when you walked away from a deal because we know all money isn't good money. And I heard both of you loud and clear, like it has to fit, it has to make sense, the culture has to be there. Um, so any examples of when you had to really assess and say, wow, no thank you. So last month, <laughs> just last month, <laughs> uh, perfect you, timing. I'll tell you a good story first, which is in Jan in July of 2017, I got a call about this company called Lafada um, Contract Services. Mike Lafada was a founder and built a business to $15 million and was looking for a strategic partner. I told him, hey, I'd love to do it. I've heard a lot about, um, you know, sort of, Exelon and Pico's focus on supplier diversity, I think we can make one plus one equal three. And he's like, well, I don't know about supplier diversity, but let me go back and ask. He went back and asked his people, the people at Exelon was like, dude, that would really be helpful. I called, you know, what was then the guy named Emmett Vaughn, who was the head of supplier diversity for Exelon, and then indirectly met a woman named Bernice Lewis, who I think is in the room now. And at the end of the day, they were like, this is a great asset we can do so much together. And so that customer call and that reference on both you, but also on the business and the opportunity is the last step before you should write checks. Mm -hmm. And so a month ago, um, I met a fabulous woman owned, uh, minority owned business in a space in utilities, I'll keep it broad. And we spent $500,000 on due diligence trying to get to one of the larger acquisitions I would have completed. And the final step, we had the money, we had the deal negotiated, is to make five customer calls where we talked to the people and said, hey, here's what we're doing. Um, tell me what you like, what don't you like, et cetera. And all five of them said that there's some systemic changes happening in the product that they're selling that's gonna result in us spending less money with that company over mm. the next 24 months. And we talked to the seller and they're like, well, they've been saying that for 10 years and they still always wind up writing the check and it's all good. And reality is like, I've raised the money, I've done all the work, mm -hmm. I got $500,000 of our money working and I had to say, we gotta stop mm. because I love this entrepreneur and they're in the seats. They believe that what they're saying is true. Mm -hmm. But when these five customers tell you something different, you gotta pause. Yes. And so we walked away, we lost our half a million dollars and hopefully we continue to be good friends with the seller, but they obviously are frustrated because mm -hmm. we wasted their time. Mm -hmm. But losing money is the fastest way to not be good at this business. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to make sure that we protect our investors and and our mode of what we think. And the moment you hear something that doesn't work, you gotta be willing to stop. Yeah, it, it sounds like you paid attention to the red flags because everything up to that point 
look great. And I, I think there's something in there that you did your due diligence with the customers too, right? Because it's one thing to hear what the companies are saying, what the employees are saying, because we, we talked about that. But what are the customers saying? Because their voice matters too. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that example. How about you, Jose? Yeah, I mean, look, due diligence, just to talk about it a little bit more, and yes. everybody might have different experience relative to due diligence. It's the crux of the deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have one chance to get it right, and in that due diligence period, you're going to learn a lot about that business, and there's going to be red flags. I, I don't think we've ever done a deal where there hasn't been a red flag. Mm -hmm. So you just need to know what they are. They're, most of the red flags you can get comfortable around with enough diligence and enough education of asking the right customer mm -hmm. questions, but there's always going to be something that comes up in a mm -hmm. deal. The question is, how many things come up? You know, are there inconsistencies? Somebody talked about that earlier. Are there inconsistencies in the data versus what they say versus what their financials show? Uh, you know, what's the motive for the sale? I think that's a huge, huge driver, right? You know, everybody, you know, I, if, if, if you've seen projections of businesses that are selling, very rarely do I see a projection where the business is showing that it's going to decline in, in the next year or the outer years. It's always going up, right, which is also somewhat unrealistic, and it's unrealistic to, to fully bank on that. But what's the motivation of the sellers? Are they really are they really in it? Are they really going to stay on? You know, are you incenting them to stay on? Is there a financial benefit for them staying on, or a financial penalty if they don't stay on? So I think all these things matter. The reality is, I think we've done 65 deals since 2007, since I became CEO. There's hundreds that we've looked at that we haven't done. And by the way, those hundreds, you learn an enormous amount of information. Somebody talked about it earlier that. You actually learn a lot from the deals that you pass up on. Mm -hmm. You know, just by doing the diligence, just by understanding what businesses do, what they might do different than you, you actually learn about that you're able to then, you know, kind of put into your own business to, to improve your own business. But if you're, if you're active in the M&A space, you're going to walk away from deals. Uh, I think it's, it's really important to understand. And, and I think the personal contact, you know, you talked about it as well, Taurus, is you want to get to know these owners. They want to get to know you. If somebody's willing to sell you their business, and they've only talked to you on Zoom, I would, I would argue, don't buy them. Because they're really not that interested in staying with you. If they haven't actually met with you, had dinner with you, you guys have talked about your families, you understand what, make them, mm -hmm. understand what makes them tick, it's, it's very difficult to think that that person's actually going to have a very deep relationship with you long term. I'm more old school, though, so maybe that'll be different <laughs> soon. But I'm more old school. <laughs> uh, a couple things that comes up. One is um, the deals I didn't do like the one I just walked away from, it's going to be successful. It is a successful entrepreneur. It's not a question of whether they'll be successful. Mm -hmm. It's simply I underwrote to something else and it became unsafe for a new person. But most of the deals I've walked away from continue to be successful. Mm -hmm. Two, as a minority firm buying businesses, I don't think it's great to do turnarounds, right? Particularly if you're trying to sell to supplier diversity supplier diversity's first step is to they want to make sure they're hiring or selecting vendors that you know fit into their supply chain and have low you know low safety ratings or good safety results and you know meet the definition of what a good supplier is it's counterintuitive to go out and buy something that isn't working say you're going to fix it and then run back to a large corporation and say, I want to have you buy from it, mostly because that large corporation likely will have a 20 year history of all the times that that company's name didn't perform well. And just cause you have owned it and sort of put lipstick on it for a year, it's not going to be easy for you to get back into the supply chain. So when in doubt, it's better to buy higher quality business that has a proven record versus a turnaround even though that means you technically likely have to pay a little bit more. No, that's great. It's great insight. And I think something I want to go back to is um, you talked about the red flag, Jose, and I'm glad you mentioned it. Both of you did. But, Jose, the point you made was all deals are going to have them. So, like, you know, don't don't be afraid of that. But I do want to know, like, what's your non-negotiable? Like, what's the red flag, no matter how nice it looks? You're just not going to do it. Integrity. Integrity. And I'll tell you, this is, I'll tell you an example. We were looking at a company uh, that was doing installation of power facilities on, on mobile sites. And I'm not going to get too specific, but they were doing a lot of international work as well as domestic work. 
and you'd see these financials and you were like, my God, this is, this is such a good business. A lot of it was government. There was a lot of government ties to the business. A lot of the big government contractors were working in them. And, you, you know, kept asking the question, how are you getting this work? How are you getting this work at such high margins? And there was an insinuation at some point of potential kickbacks. They didn't say it, but, you know, they did not say it either. And that was it. I mean, walked away from the deal. A, a business that's based on a lack of integrity, at some point or another, it's going to catch up to you and you're going to fail. So that's the, that's the one walk away immediately. We're here to do things right. You know, obviously everybody wants to succeed. You want to have fun doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. but you want to do it honestly and with a, a lot of integrity because the only thing you have when this is all said and done is your name that's it. and your reputation. And any of these deals impact, impact that, whether you want it or not. If you decide to buy a company, whatever that company does is, is, is going to be a part of you, and it's going to be a part of your legacy. So that's the to me, it's the it's the one very immediate X. No, that's awesome. Um, you know, there's many ways to do things, but the right way, right, with integrity. Taurus, how about you? Non-negotiable. Um, seller doesn't put up money. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. Like it, it, the beauty of my life is I'm clear that I don't know a lot, and so I hire a lot of people i partner with a lot of people and when i'm buying a business we do something called a two-step buyout which says i need that owner or that founder to roll over 20 to 49 percent of the capital into the business on a go forward basis with me why because i want them to have a second bite of the apple that is material enough that they will be incented to ensure the success and survival of that business the same way I am. I want to row in the same boat post-close. If you're not prepared to roll over capital, I'm out because it means you might leave quickly. You're not setting up to be my partner and you're trusting that I know more about your business than you mm -hmm. do. And I know that's not true. So you must roll over capital and be willing to be my partner going forward. No, that's a good one. So they got to have skin in the game, integrity and skin in the game. So let's talk about, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about um, some of the myth busting. I know in the space that, that I play in um, with DE&I, especially in addition to my day job, I am constantly beating the drum of driving shifting spend and growing spend with our diverse suppliers. At Comcast, we have more than 3,000 approved diverse suppliers. And guess what? We're swiping the credit card anyway. So why not with one of the 3,000 diverse suppliers? But there's a notion, not just at Comcast, but just in the marketplace, that perhaps if it's a diverse-owned business, it's less quality or it's less dependable or some of those other myths that I know I'm on a war path to bust. H how are you doing that in your space and how can we help all of our diverse suppliers and, and small businesses do the same? Yeah, I grew up in it. So I got involved in the business and, you know, out of college, 1993, 94 was when I, I really started growing. We were a $100 million South Florida based company company that my father started and we were starting to expand across the country and you know I think I'm fresh out of college I got a master's boy am I smart I'm gonna go around and convince everybody they need to be using us <laughs> for these services and everywhere I went people would look at me and say oh you're, you're just here to check the box yeah my my boss told me I had to meet with you so just check the box mm -hmm. and if you end up getting any work it's just because we need to fill a quota and I was so pissed but that was the world we were living in, and I, and I swore. I, you know, I started going to meetings, and we, start, we stopped filling out the supplier diversity forms. We stopped filling them out in the late 90s. I didn't want meetings with supplier diversity. I didn't want anybody to take a meeting because they thought I was going to be a quota or I was going to check some box. And I'm here today, quite frankly, because the NMSDC and all the different groups across the country, including this, you've made a difference. You've made it so that corporations realize that it has nothing to do with checking a box. That's it's right. got nothing to do with a quota. It has nothing to do, quite frankly, even, and we could argue this, with the social impact or the social benefit that it's creating. What, what, what you've done as an organization is you've proven that diversity is good business. That's it. First and foremost, it. it's good business. It's got nothing to That's do right. with the social aspect of That's it. Right. 
That's right. It, 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 really, it really does, right? The fact that you are servicing a population that is diverse means that you have to have a supplier base that's diverse because they're going to give you differences of opinions. They're going to give you, they're going to give you everything you need to make your business better. So let's fast forward. We're both big businesses today. It's our job to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. It's our job to make sure that in our organizations, we're using diverse suppliers and we have diverse partners and we're doing everything we can to lay out a helping hand to that starting, that company that's starting up just like we did a long time ago. Because it feels good, yeah, it does feel good. But that's not the reason. It's good business because <laughs> they're going to bring in thought processes and thinking into your organization that you don't have today. So first and foremost, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, to me the most important part is everybody better understand we're doing it because it makes a ton of business sense. All of the other things, they're gravy. They're super important. Mm -hmm. they're, but I'm not, I'm, it, is, it is critically important, all of the other issues. But the fact that it's good business should make it a real no-brainer. And I think we're closer to that than we've ever been before. Yeah, well said. I mean, there's, yeah, get free. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working with like no hands to clap. So thank you for clapping on my behalf. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's so important, right? It, you know, I, I have this conversation all the time, almost daily, whether it's diverse hires or diverse businesses. We are not risky business, we are smart business. And Harvard Business and so many other publications have proven that diverse companies win, right? Diverse teams are more profitable. We heard Dr. Williams talk about diversity of thought and I'm ready for the generation A's. I'm ready for the fourth graders to change the world, right? Because we have to disrupt the patterns of thinking and the systems that, that put us in the box that we're in today. So I thank you for that. And I, I like to say one more thing. I'm sure Taurus can add a lot to this. Yes. Story. And then when you use diverse suppliers, you create wealth. Yes. For so long, yes. we talked about supplier diversity, about being small business. And, oh, yeah, you've got to be small to be diverse. Or, you know, yeah, let's look for the small companies to help. <laughs> Again, critically important. Why is it wrong to have big, diverse companies? That's right. <laughs> Why is that a bad thing? We're a Fortune 500 business today. I'm so proud of that. I am so proud that we, I think we're the first Hispanic company to ever be a Fortune 500 business. That's a great pride. Amazing. But on top of that. That's yes, amazing. But, but, thank you. But on, on top of it, prideful, it creates wealth yes. for me, for my management team, yes. for all of those associated with us, for your company, for your business. And where do you think that money goes? That's right. It goes right back into our communities. That's it. The communities that represent it. And then that helps the community lift. And that's the whole, and, it's, it's, it's mind boggling to me, some of the arguments that I feel we have to make at times as to why it's good business, but it's good all the way around. I'm fortunate, I'm blessed. I couldn't imagine in a million years being where I'm sitting today having the benefits that I've had. Me and my brother, we bought a soccer team. We own a major league franchise in this country. Think about that, a minority owned major league franchise in this, in this it's, it's soccer, so it's not the NFL or the NBA. And we That's, get all right. it. That's all right. That's all right. Tars and, is, and you Tars guys is got, ready. You guys got the Philadelphia <laughs> Union that happened to win the <laughs> Eastern Conference this year, and, and we're, we're coming for you, we're coming for it. you. But, but, but think about it, it and, and now in our city, the city that I grew up, that I was born in, that's a predominantly Hispanic city, we have the first minority ownership of a, of a major league franchise in a diverse city. Wow. It's quite remarkable, right? But that's where we will get to. We keep having successes. We keep changing the world yes. one step at a time. Yes. And that's what we should strive to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It gives me chills because those are the myths that we have to bust, right? It's systemic. Those are the systems and the beliefs that we have to break through. One of my favorite books is Think Like a Scientist. Think again. And, and the author, you know, Adam Smith, talks about thinking like a scientist. And what are those things we need to learn having a growth mindset? But what are those things we need to unlearn, right? And one of the things we need to unlearn is that that diversity is, is something for a box, but it's really about smart business. So thank you for that. Taurus, I know you're gonna to add to it. Um, I wanna echo and echo what he said. Yes. And um, I'm gonna take a different approach, which is um, you know, one of the highest compliments I can make today is to Jamu and Jay, where I tried to do business with them and I wasn't ready yet. Right. And it's the hardest thing to stomach as an entrepreneur when someone tells you you're not ready because you look at your toolkit 
and you're like, well, I'm just as good as someone else. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a couple things. I didn't have the ability to field a team big enough to basically submit against all the things that were going to be required for a particular assignment they were looking for. Didn't have it. And didn't have the money to fund a team and to understand what it meant to do business at scale in the type of opportunity that I was trying to bid on. What that tells me and what I think we have to hear as minority businesses is when you're not ready, receive the feedback and then mm. figure out what I need to do to get better. Mm. And what I've learned is that it really is very helpful. to ha if it, It's hard for a diverse business to follow the business school advice of customer diversification. And why that is, is because you have to declare, I'm going to do business with Exelon, I'm going to do business with Comcast, I'm going to do business with Merck, three of my larger customers in the room. And when I do that, I then can hire 200000 dollars $500,000 people who work in that system, who worked with that corporation in that supply chain that will reduce the degrees of complexity for me to become a good vendor to them. And so my suggestion for breaking the myths is to be more intentional about the, the, your top two or three large corporations you want to do business with, mm. to scale to the point by hiring people that work within that customer that make it easier for you to do business. I do have Comcast as customers in two of my businesses today. Um, but I've taken a slower approach because when you do that, you can have tremendous success. And with Exelon and with Merck and with Comcast, I'm having tremendous success, but I had to tool for the opportunity. I think that's really, really important to know your capabilities, right? To know when you're ready. But what I heard was humility. Um, you know, that Jay and team told you why you weren't ready, but then gave I, you I the I, feedback. I, to be fair, I didn't really accept it. <laughs> <laughs> but I've grown. Yes, yes that's okay. That's self-awareness. So team, that's self-awareness. That That is fantastic. And it's really how we respond to that feedback, right? So do we react or do we respond? Because I tend to believe when we respond, we can grow in that moment versus, you know, what does Jake have to say? You know, who is he to tell me I'm not ready, right? I'm just as good as everyone else. And look where you are today. So that is fantastic. All right, Jay, time check, because I got one more for them and then the audience. Okay, this is my favorite, my really favorite question. What would you tell your younger self uh, just getting into this space? You know, what so advice? I, so I've got a, a younger son, but you, you made a comment earlier, There's a there's a phrase that, I think about all the time and I actually like and it's, it says think like an immigrant as socially awkward as that may sound these days with all the politics behind that think like an immigrant and the, say, and, the, and the reason I say it is there's so many people that come here that start with nothing and they have no option but to succeed mm -hmm. failure is not an option yes. they're gonna grind they're gonna do whatever they have to do to win and by the way those people around us every single day in whatever field and whatever you do and the minute that you take your eye off the ball the minute that you rest there's somebody with that thinking right behind you mm -hmm. so no matter how successful how big mm -hmm. you get or how, how, how important you think you are on your business you know think about everything that it took to get you there and keep that front and center every single day and work like a beast because if you're not chasing somebody, there's somebody chasing you, so you better be catching up. You better create create, the, create the whoever you're chasing because somebody's right on your tracks chasing you. So stay humble and stay aggressive. I love that. Thank you. Taurus, what would you tell your younger self um, just getting in this space? So mentorship slash apprenticeship to ownership, right? And so for me, I start clipping articles on Reginald Lewis and – Henry Kravis and I clip articles on Jose Moss um, because I don't need to talk to him. I'm so grateful that I am now. I might be able to move you from indirect to direct. But um, you can read about people. You can learn other people's paths in a way that it reduces your learning curve. Two, I have a business partner that I met at 18 in, business, in college who's now my business partner. And he's been where I haven't been. And so if you look at your teams, whether it's advisors or people on your team, if someone hasn't been three to five to 10 years ahead of where you've been, then stop and go get that person, mm -hmm. right? Because 
you need to reduce the, the, the learning curve, and you can do that by having people who are your advisors, mentors, or, or, or workmates that have been where you haven't been. And so the step, first step is, if you can't say who your mentors and who your heroes are and mm -hmm. who's on your team that's not been where you are, stop. And then finally, it's about ownership. Like, don't, don't wait too late. You're going to learn more in the seat. And so start writing checks to your friends, start writing checks to your colleagues who are doing interesting things. Start buying and building your own businesses earlier in your career and often. And if you're an entrepreneur, buy more things. Like just, just be, it's like Monopoly. The Monopoly is the most valuable thing. Every time you pass go, you get $200. What do you do? No one has ever won Monopoly in cash. You got to keep buying mm -hmm. houses and then yes. you can buy hotels and that's how you win the game. I love that. Great, great advice. Thank you. Not just for your younger self, but for all of us in the room. All right. So with that, we're going to open it up to the audience. Yes, yes. Uh, audience questions. That was phenomenal. Round of phenomenal. applause. Round of applause. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Awesome. <laughs> questions. We have a question. We have Steven and Ajamu um, yeah. going through. And please, when you ask a question, introduce yourself. Yeah, so thank you, great presentation. Um, I have a bit of a background in M&A myself before I joined the Comcast team here in the procurement department. So I kind of want to ask, you mentioned that it's not all about synergies when you're going to do deals, right? And synergies do not necessarily have to be the people you know, that you may or may not replace, but can you talk about any of the synergies you might have found in the value creation stage, potentially in the procurement space as you kind of integrated those companies into your platforms? Yeah, so a couple of things. I, I, let me maybe elaborate. So for me, when we run our financial modeling around deals, we don't add synergies. And again, we're, we're more in a construction-based organization where the reality is that we don't feel that we should be paying for the synergies that we're ultimately going to create. Now, there's lots of different deal structures. So there's deal structures where if, where if, where if the owners are keeping skin in the game in whatever fashion, they're going to benefit from that synergy creation but never make it part of the upfront deal because if you do, then you're forced to actually deliver on those synergies. And unfortunately, right, most synergies are around costs. They're not necessarily. Now, you, there's lots of other synergies that are important, and one of them is revenue synergies. So when you, wh when you buy a business, so if you're looking to scale your business and you buy a business that's going to bring you another customer, maybe for the same services that you pr provide today, right, you could argue that that's a revenue synergy that both of you together should be able to grow those customers faster than you could individually. But the reality is there's a lot of costs associated with that too because nobody's got people sitting on the sidelines waiting to get that work. But you know, there, there are a lot of synergies you want to look at as part of the deal. My point is more I hate valuing those synergies in the deal because then I think it forces decisions that may not always be in, they may, it, it makes integration a lot harder if you're forcing those decisions on synergies early. I'll just say it slightly differently than that. I won't buy a business if I don't think I add value. And similar to Jose, most of our value creation is on business development. All the people in this room are in business development functions because we're gonna work harder, we're gonna think like an immigrant, we're gonna make more phone calls, and we're gonna help that business grow differently than they did prior to us owning it. I don't put it into the equation for how I value it, but I put it into the equation of should I waste my time? Mm -hmm. And so if you can't believe that you can help grow a business through revenue or through expansion into new markets or through acquisitions, then I would argue let someone else buy that business and wait until you can find a business that you can believe you can add revenue synergy and value creation to because all you have is your time, and so don't waste it on things that you, don't, you aren't the best buyer for. Mm -hmm. And I would add, if you're a seller, if you don't think that the buyer is bringing value to you, don't sell to that buyer. Mm -hmm. it goes I both think it ways. works both ways. It goes both ways. That's awesome. I think we have another question in the back. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Colleen Lacoste. I am the certification manager. Um, we provide the WBE, the Women Owned Certification. We work closely with um, EMSDC. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone who's in the supplier diversity world here. Um, it amazes me working every day with these small business owners how many people, I mean, at least probably two thirds that I work with that get certified that have never even heard of what supplier diversity is. And they are just getting certified because they've had one client ask them to, um, whether it's you know Comcast or, or PSEG, any of the, the corporates that we work with. Um, so thank you for the work that you do because it is so important, um, you know, the education that you do with these small business owners and internally in your corporation as well to make sure you hit those diversity goals. So my question for you is, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of these uh, goals being set um, and education specifically around uh, procurement of goods and services. What focus are we seeing on that now in M&A and investments? Um, you know, for a small business owner that's ready to take that step, who do they talk to within your organization um, to, to explore the possibility of getting an investment or working, you know, with you guys as an acquisition? And are you guys actively setting goals for that as well? Um, you know, what do you, um, look at when you're looking overall at your m a goals you know what how is diversity a part of that too so i know that's a two-pronged question um so you know of the soon to be eight acquisitions four have been with women-owned businesses one has been with a minority-owned business i'd say seven out of eight have been certified as minority post-close um our strategy uh is a couple full one is on a personal level, our goals are to help fund and support, you know, five or more businesses that can buy 25 to 100 million dollar businesses over the next three to five years. It's less about it being a direct investment or control by me, but to anchor and sponsor other people in this thing called entrepreneurship through acquisition. And so that's the pass it forward. Um, from the standpoint of minority or women owned businesses, there's two buckets. There's those who are looking for capital because they want a succession or exit the business. Well, that's just an M&A transaction. And there's those that are looking for growth capital. They may not want minority control capital. They want minority capital. There's a universe of financing sources for that. And in the last part of your question is just where do they go? You know, there's something called a small business investor alliance, which is, you know, call it 300 plus small business investment companies that have capital that is set up to provide mezzanine or senior debt capital. There's the NAAC, which is the Minority Trade Association, which has 130 members looking for capital uh, or opportunities to invest. There's Mark Harrison in the room who is an expert in growth capital and you know sort of the minority growth initiative of which Jose Moss has a lot of experience and success in. It's a, it's a, again, I go back to diversity as an asset. It's an ecosystem of people wanting to help, not because they can profit, but because we want to help. And if you could just, you know, I'm widely available by LinkedIn. Most, many people here know both of us. We may not be the solution for you, but our job is to pass you to someone mm -hmm. that might be more set up for you, if not us. Yeah, I did all that. One thing I would add is one of the things that we're doing uh, beyond just m a is there's an enormous amount of work in in the businesses that we operate in Taurus operates in some of the same businesses we want to help create businesses so we're actually we've done deals with the SBA we've done deals with banks to have SBA loans for people that are starting their business so going down to you know somebody wants to buy a directional drill rig will actually co-sign for it as an entity, will allow them to start their business, they'll work for us, they'll pay that rig off over time, and then it's their business, right? And, they, and, and we're a captive customer of that business for a long time, and hopefully, and, and we're really focused on, on, on diversity and inclusion within that business, because I think it's a great way to help start a lot of new businesses, irrespective of M&A. Awesome, thank you, great question. Any other questions? All right few hands. Good afternoon. Um, great presentation today. Uh, Gerald Jones, uh, CEO of a company called Union Corps America. We do uh, venture capital investing around Philly. So my question is about failures. 
you know, we've all had perfect deals, right? You know, we talked about the deals you walked away from. Give us a little insight on the deals that failed for you after you were, after you started your integration of, you know, of, of the transaction. Lots of failures, unfortunately, <laughs> right? Uh, How long you got? Look, so, so How much I'll, time I'll, I'll say a couple things, right? One is if you did your work, you, you might make mistakes, but if you did your work, don't lose faith. We've bought a lot of businesses that first year out of the gate, horrific. Everything that you didn't anticipate that could have gone wrong went wrong. <laughs> but if, if, if you bought for the right reasons, if you bought the right management teams, and you believed in the businesses, a lot of those turned around. So we've had a bunch of businesses that we've bought that after one year, you'd think time to throw the towel in, clean house. You can't, right? You gotta kinda just, if, if, it's, if, if you can actually identify exactly what happened in the business, what was the downturn, what created it, then you need to hold, right? And that's easier said than done. And hope that it fixes itself. And quite frankly, we've probably made bad decisions on both sides of that. Having learned early that something that went bad and then you make a bunch of wholesale changes and the changes end up being a disaster. And then we've had others where we waited and things ended up being really good. So my, my learning lesson out of that after having had some bad experiences is, you know, if you did your work up front and you believe in what you bought, let it go through. It's going to have, you know, we're, in, we're unfortunately, we're in a cyclical business. Sometimes it's really good, but sometimes there's periods of time where it goes down. You got to kind of ride through that. Uh, and then I think it goes back to integrity, right? And sometimes you miss things. Sometimes, you know, there's things that are, you know, somebody, you know, lies on their financial statements, right? Or has, you know, significant issues with financial statements that you catch after the fact. Those are things that I think you have to deal with very swiftly and you need to move on and kind of count your losses, because if somebody's not honest coming into a deal, that's not something you can change. Yeah, I'd have to just start by where you finish, which is I bought a uh, you know, $25 million food business. The entrepreneur and the president basically had a separate business where they were you know, basically charging more money to the company and making money outside of what they had disclosed to mm. us. I was, a, I was a freshman, I was a sophomore. I was like, oh my God, that's a big offense. That's a lack of integrity, get out. They left, the two salespeople left with them. Now I didn't have any salespeople, I'm the CEO of Chung's Gourmet Foods. And guess what, we lost our money, right? And firing people um, is a quick way to lose money. Mm. Integrity in that situation was, did they lie to me or did I not ask the right question? Yeah, that's it. And I don't know, but I know one thing, I'm gonna do my best not to let people leave, <laughs> is what I learned, because even if they lied to me, I'm gonna slowly walk them out mm -hmm. the door because people are everything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I just can't go back to partnership and people mm -hmm. first as a value yeah. because even when you have, I, I don't have enough money to buy great businesses. I have enough money to buy hopefully good business with the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that there are going to be holes in the management team. Mm -hmm. There are gonna be changes that happen post-close. And as you get older, you stop asking as many questions. You stop trying to make as many quick changes because it's like changing your mama or your family. Like people don't change that much, right? You can hire more people to sort of mask some of the, the blemishes or to, to supplement what's not there. But that journey takes time and it's gonna be some hires that don't work out because mm -hmm. the fit isn't there. And most buyers, I would argue earlier in their career, try to go too fast and try to fix things too, too abruptly. Um, and so try to keep the people don't make sudden decisions. Mm -hmm. When you have to act, act decisively. Mm -hmm. But all that change stuff, man, it's a good way to lose money. Yeah, and I also heard another good tip. The right questions, asking the right questions are really, is really important. Any other hands, Jay, out there? Hi, Mark Harrison. Um, uh, first, a comment and some information, then I wanna ask you a question. Um, there's a natural tension, I think, for any certified diverse business as you're trying to go through and try and raise capital to do a, an acquisition is how do you maintain your certification, right? You're bringing on investment from the outside. It's usually the requirement is you, if 
you're a minority business, you have to make 51% ownership. Well, when investors come in, there's a, you know, you're going to get uh, ratcheted down your ownership. And so there's always a tension uh, of, you know, do I remain a certified business or uh, do I just take the money and, and go? Uh, so my point of information for those of you who are certified by the NMSDC or the Eastern Regional Council is that there is a program uh, called the Growth Initiative uh, Certification Program, which allows for MBEs who are certified by uh, NMSDC to take on equity investment, dropping them below the 51% ownership requirement, but still meeting their certification, still remaining a certified MBE if they meet certain other uh, requirements. So I wanted to get that information out there. And I'm happy to say, proud to say, that uh, MOSTEC is a, a certified under the Growth Initiative Program. So. You can even be a publicly traded company, a Fortune 500 company, and still maintain your uh, NMSDC certified minority organization, uh, certification. So my, my question is, is uh, particularly for you, Taurus, and, and for you as well, Jose, kind of how does the certification question kind of play in as you're kind of looking at deals, if you're trying to structure deals? Um, just how does that play into your thought process with regards to kind of scaling businesses? Um, so my entire business is uh, set up to try to do work in a place where I think there's a gap. So I'm looking for minority businesses. I'm looking for woman-owned businesses. I'm looking for non-minority businesses that would make sense to be converted into minority-owned businesses, right? So it's, and again, it's 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 a place where I think there's opaqueness. Is a place where not everyone gets the advantage or how to structure, and so. I think about it all day, right, um, as a going in assumption. Now, what I believe is that um, supplier diversity or certification standards are based on, they get that you gotta raise money to build your business, to acquire your business, but the capital starts out with this sort of vanilla understanding that if we give you this money, we got to have these decision mites. We got to have this amount of control, and you, the entrepreneur, have to pledge personal guarantee, or you, the entrepreneur, have to give me the ability to hire and fire you, and all these things that don't match up against certification. And what I think we have done, and you have done through the growth initiative, is to explain to capital that no, you don't have to have all of these extra bells and whistles that then creates more freedom for entrepreneurs and for you know businesses like Mostec to basically take on capital that delivers a market rate return to that capital without tarnishing the, divert, the, the minority certification. And so it's been my experience that capital follows returns. And if you can justify and demonstrate market rate returns and safety of their capital, they can give it to you in an unencumbered way that helps you to build businesses that are more valuable. You know, a little different for us, and I think it has to do with how we grew up in the business, right? So we had that period of time where, quite frankly, we didn't want people to know we were minority because we were afraid about the business repercussions. Mm -hmm. So the importance of certification probably weren't as important to us back then as we were growing because it wasn't how we were trying to sell ourselves. So we, we grew up in a different environment. Today I take incredible pleasure. It's very important for us to be certified and I, and I think we will protect it at all costs. So we will protect our ownership percentage so we don't lose certification. Almost more as really trying to be an example of what you could potentially achieve as a minority owned business. More so than what it does for our business. For 90% of our customers, 80% of our customers, they don't even know that we're certified, quite frankly, right? We have certain customers that, that, that are very engaged with NMSCC that it's important for, but we have so many, and we actually try to educate those customers that don't seem to care for it, why it should be important, and trying to get them more engaged with NMSCC at a national level to understand it. I think as any MBE, as any business owner, you would ultimately want to be able to say that your business, you have your business, not because you're certified, not solely because you're a minority, but because it's good business and you're doing a hell of a job for your customer. I think that's, that should be all of our goals, but I do think certification is important. It's important to us. 
but if you can get business without having to be certified, get it, right? Don't, you don't solely have to focus on certified business. You can grow your business, and if you can take on investment to make it a great business where you don't need to be certified, that's okay. It doesn't change that you're not, you know, nobody can tell me I'm not a minority business. I'm sorry. Like, no, nobody's ever going to convince me that Mossic's not a minority in business. It's not going to happen. I don't care whether we're certified or not. It's, it's ingrained in everything that we do, but I, I do think it's important. Now, for a, for a company starting today, if you're starting a new initiative, the advantages that it gives you to be certified, the doors that it opens, I mean, it's, it's, it's unreal. The opportunities that we all have as diverse businesses to start our business, to get a foot in the door, I, I, it's unmatched. With that said, all it, all it means is you're going to have a door opened. You're going to get a meeting with somebody. You're going to get an opportunity to pitch your services. It doesn't guarantee you a darn thing. So don't think that just because you do it, it's going to guarantee, it doesn't guarantee you anything. It's going to get you a foot in the door, and it's going to get you a meeting that you probably wouldn't have been able to get without it. But then you need to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to prove your business strategy. You need to be there for the right reasons. And then you ultimately need to execute. Only other thing I'd add is, like, as you set up your minority business, I think I have 70 or so investors, and 50-plus of them are minority, right? So it pushes you to go the extra mile in also trying to get individuals and institutions that are diverse to support you. Mm -hmm. And their money may be green and it's all the same, but when people lean in and write a check, they start to really lean in to help you build your businesses too. And so I, it, it, it helps you to push yourself to go, go ask more people for money, uh, something that most people aren't comfortable doing. Jay, how are we doing on time? Do we have we time have, for one more? Uh, one more. Okay. One more. Awesome. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Paul Douglas, uh, president of the JPI Group. I want to start off by thanking Jay Ajam, who was just behind me, uh, and Comcast. And um, probably most importantly, this panel has been awesome. Like, I, I go to a lot of these events, and as always, I learn a lot. But there's a lot that you guys said today that's really influential and impactful for myself. So uh, our company does workforce development for the states, cities, um, and utilities. And the one that you said, Taurus, that's critical for me is um, I wish I knew seven years ago about utility and government contracts. Right? There's certain industries, if you're in those industries, the likelihood of success, I think, goes up a little. So my question to you guys, one, what industries should we be in? Right? I don't think every industry is the same. Right? There's different gross profit, different margins, different... Um, commitment to DEI and supply diversity. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, I think a lot of success for companies depends on timing. Looking at today's, um, this where we are as a company and where we are as a, uh, as a country, what things should we consider? Like what types of companies will probably grow fastest now compared to maybe three, four years ago? And thank you guys in advance. That's a great question. Look, I, I think, man, um, people should do what they love first, right? Um, but I think I love feeding my family first. <laughs> so, and so, like, I don't have a house music club, for example, because I don't think that's a good business. Um, I have always had this real simple philosophy, wh whether it be looking at a company or looking at uh, an entrepreneur trying to raise money. I look to the left, look to the right, and say, have any of those people done that before, or how many people have failed, right? And so if you look at a supplier to Walmart, I've supplied Walmart a lot in my life in my previous career, um, they discontinue people all the time, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that means they're going to fire me one day too. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the utility space or if you look at the government space, they value, it's almost like a best value type of concept where low price isn't more valuable than a great safety record, isn't more mm -hmm. valuable than having worked on their system, mm -hmm. right? And having, um, you know, good price. And so I like businesses that require best value mm -hmm. because it means if I do my job and keep performing and keep reinvesting and keep being a better vendor to you, then there's a good chance I can grow with you. Mm -hmm. And so those sectors that I'm in, which is, you know, second largest supplier to military food, um, we do I second or the largest sort of staff hog business to the state of Pennsylvania in a staff IT business. Um, you know, we do 
portal management for city of Fairfax, city of Arlington, they're not turning off their computer anytime soon. And so as long as I keep maintaining their internet site for them, it's a good chance I won't get fired. And then in electrical contracting uh, with Car and Duff or with Lafat and a pass, it's all about best value, not necessarily always lowest price. So those are the sectors that I would play and I would avoid things where you keep seeing RFPs and people either winning on price or innovation, right? Because you know, it just means you're going to get fired one day too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two so, things I'd say to, to the certification, right? The, the groups that are involved in the different SDCs across the country, right? They're, they really care. So it's easy to get your business started through one of those corporates that are engaged and involved. So I would argue that if you're starting your business today and you're, and you're focused on diversity and inclusion, that's the best place to start. But once you offer your services to those, to, to those members that are involved, and if, and if you start doing a good job, start branching out to the customers that maybe aren't engaged and aren't involved. Because it may be that they're more interested in giving you the opportunity, but the service is still needed by everybody. So don't be afraid of venturing out to companies that aren't necessarily engaged. Convince them why, you, they, just, why they need your product. Convince them why they, you're the best at what they do, and they're going to use you and then eventually try to drag them back in. In terms of the businesses to get engaged with and the industries, uh, we're in, I, I, I pinch myself because I think we're in incredible markets. You know, we're, we're building wind and solar. We're, one of the, we're the biggest builders of wind and solar in the United States. We're, we're involved in everything that's changing in the world of energy and how energy is delivered. But at the core of it, when I think about our business, we dig ditches. That's how we started. We started by digging a ditch. You can't get any more rudimentary than digging a ditch. But that's where Mostic started, and it's still a huge piece of our revenue. So no matter what you start in, you can reinvent yourself to get involved in whatever may be, you know, whatever may drive more value. But at the core of it, do what you love. Because at the end of the day, money's great, and it, it, it obviously gives you an opportunity to have a better life. But if you're not happy with what you're doing, and you're not going to work every day, and you're excited about what, what lies ahead, none of it's worth it. Wow, well, we have been fed this afternoon. Lots of great insights and nuggets and do what you love. I love that. And there's a quote that says, when you do what you love, you don't work another day in your life, right? So I love that you gave that advice and you echoed that. Can we please give Taurus and Jose a huge round of applause? Job well done, gentlemen, job well done.